What is going on? Welcome back to the Wild Podcast. I am your host. Um, I am so glad to have another conversation with you guys. Uh, I know it's been a minute. Um, I dropped a few couple, not really episode, but just my thoughts. And please check those out um, just in case if you haven't already. Um, but this is actually going to be an episode that I've been wanting to drop for a while. And I kind of understand why I took the time to drop this episode but before we actually get into that uh please make sure that you hit that subscribe button hit that notification button and if you really enjoyed this video um it'll be a great help if you actually hit that like button as well and please don't be afraid to share it share with a friend share with a family i believe with this topic today with this episode i believe that it is going to really really hit home for a lot of people um, and the name of this episode is called Identity Theft. And what I mean by identity theft is that we currently live in a time and we live in a world where our identity is constantly being questioned, who we are, who we're supposed to be. And when you're not sure who you are, you're not sure what your identity is, it's very easy for you to kind of get caught up into what the world wants you to think. It's very easy to get caught up into the way the world wants you to be you can easily get confused and we have to remember who is the god of this world which is satan satan is the god of this world remember when adam created the first sin or committed rather the first sin he the bible says that he gave dominion to satan which means adam was originally was supposed to have dominion over this world but when he committed the first sin along with Eve, he gave that power. He gave that dominion over to Satan. And so we can see why there's all the craziness and wickedness and evilness that goes on into this world. All the craziness that goes on into this world, which we see even more than ever now, our identity is being affected by it. Where you have a lot of people who are struggling as far as like who they are. They're struggling with anxiety. They're, they're struggling with mental depression, they're struggling with um, their gender identity. You're, you're seeing just this huge increase in it. And 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 I, for me, I call it identity theft because I believe that the moment we can understand what our identity is in Christ, I believe that that would help be able to fight off some of these mass confusion. Because remember, Satan is the author of confusion. He is the father of lies this is what he does he is the person or that demonic spirit that's going to make you think the opposite of god's will he's going to make you think the opposite of what you're supposed to be and and make you feel that it's okay to feel the way that you feel but not understanding that he's also crippling you spiritually and mentally and emotionally because you're not because we're lost as far as what are our true identity is so this is something that i was thinking about for a good good while to have a conversation and i actually have recorded an episode and then i scrapped it and then i decided to kind of like wait for a little bit and then it, it just sat it really just sat to be quite honest with you and i just took some time with it and just as time went on i just allowed god to really just show me more on what our identity is and what it really means and the significance of it. Um, over the weekend, me and my wife, we hosted a Bible study at our home. And this is something that not only that we as a, me and my wife decided to do, actually, let me rewind that back. It wasn't just me and my wife. It was actually originally the idea was, uh, shout out to our good friend, Ayanna. And so one day, she, you know, I was over our house, um, and we were talking with her husband, George, out to George. And we were having a conversation. It was like, hey, you know, because we call ourselves the village, right? And we was like, hey, we should do a monthly Bible study. And I was like, yo, you know, that's a really great idea because she believes that the more that we're able to um, fellowship and even just within doing Bible study together. So every month we're picking somebody's house to do it with because it's about eight of us in total, four couples that we, we call, again, ourselves the village. And um, we figured that every month we'll host it at somebody's home. 
And this is a way for us to not only to continue to dive into the word, understand the word even more, but to fellowship and stay strong as a community, as a as a village. So we could hold each other accountable. We could learn from each other. We could learn the words from each other, things that we may not understand, things that we may be a little bit confused on, or maybe even have questions. We're able to do it in a form of a family because though we may go to church, there's only so much information you get on a Sunday, right? And it's very important to outside of church. Like I look at church as going to school. So you, you go to school, you have your classes, whether if it's, you know, Monday through Friday, if you're like in high school, elementary school, middle school, or if you're in college, maybe Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, you may have a particular class. Tuesday and Thursday, you may have a, a different type of class, you know, just depending on how your schedule has it set up. But it is your responsibility that outside of those days that you go to school and the two or three hours that you're in per class, depending how long your class is, is that you go home and study. Because your professor or your teacher can only give you so much information. But the only way you're going to be able to retain and learn and understand what you're being taught at school is by how? By studying the subject, studying whatever the class that you're taking. So that's the same thing with the Bible. That's the same thing with the word of God is that though you may go to church every Sunday or maybe watch it online and, you know, that hour, hour and a half, two hours, depending on how long the service is, it's still your responsibility as a believer to when you go home every single day to meditate on the word of God, because that's the only that's the only way you're really going to understand the word of God, understand the Bible is by staying faithful and being committed to constantly reading the word. And when you're doing that, you're going to really understand what your identity is. So we decided again, like we're going to host this Bible study. So last weekend or the weekend that just passed, this was the second Bible study that was held. The first one was at my friend Ayanna and George's house at their home. And this was the second one. And we actually spoke on this very topic because I feel like, you know what, this will be a perfect topic for us, for us to discuss about. And I really, really wish that there was, we had cameras around and everything because it was such a great, rich conversation. And it was very transparent. It was very honest, but it was very knowledgeable. And we were able to feed off of each other and we were able to learn a lot. And though this was, this session was held by me and my wife, everybody was able to collaborate with it. And I believe a lot of us, you know, walked away after that Bible study, just learning more and more about what our, our, what our identity is, because that is truly, truly important. So I want to start out with the first scripture, because all over the Bible, if you read the Bible, you're going to see how there's many different times God references what our identity is. Is and that is important. And I believe the reason why he's doing that is because he wants us to understand who we are and why he created us. So Satan does not come in and snatch us away and make us think otherwise. So the first scripture that I would actually want to go to, we're going to go to Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seventeen. It says, "Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new." That's Second Corinthians chapter five, verse. 17. So where does the scripture come from? So this scripture comes from, this is Paul um, speaking to the Corinthians church, right? And he is letting them know because during this time, the Corinthian church, you know, they had, and it's to me, I feel like it's still like that to this day with, with certain churches where they have adopted their own theology. They, they adapted their own way of, of, of how church politics, church laws, or how church should be run. And it was a lot of dysfunction. And so what Paul did, he decided to like, okay, you know what, let me go over there and try to get things in order. And so one of the things he talks about is just as a reminder that you are a new creation. So the old ways that we used to think, because they wanted to adapt some of the old theology and, 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 and some of the old practices and practice that they actually um, added on or wanted to include that was not that was not godly that was not biblical um things that they've learned from rituals or from that they've learned from paying worshiping other pagan gods and and other customs and cultures and so forth and it started to kind of just taint things 
and they felt that, hey, you know what? This is how we want to run the church. But when, you, when you're doing it, you're mixing things up. You're diluting it. And it becomes less and less about God. It becomes more and more about your old cultural beliefs. And so it's that reminded that you are a new creation. And so we think differently. And because we're a new creation, because Jesus Christ died on the cross for us, he died for our sins. And now that he has, he's resurrected, which means he defeated death. Something that Satan thought that he had won. Jesus decided to get and, and, and show him like, no, this is the true victory here. So now our sins has been forgiven. Now we go to, we go to Jesus when we need to be asked or to be forgiven for our, our, our sins. So being a new creation, which means now we have to constantly renew our mind. We don't think the same. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. The way we live our lives now is going to be according to the will of God. It's not going to be the will of the world because the will of the world is what's going to cause all this masses mass confusion and but the will of god is going to make things clear because now you're going to see what the truth is and you're going to understand that hey because i am a new creation the my old ways are gone and the new ways is what i'm going to live for and i'm going to adapt now it doesn't mean that you're not going to struggle with your flesh because our body remember being a new creation all that means is that we have the holy spirit that lives inside of us but we still have this physical body that we that 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 we're carrying or that that is that is part of us that is us right so our flesh is naturally going to have natural desires but the key thing to be able to control your flesh is that you need to understand now because you are a new creation that you have dominion over your flesh which means you have to constantly control your flesh i'll give an example so Naturally, our bodies need certain amount of nutrients and calories per day to survive, right? We need to drink a certain amount of water. We need to eat a certain amount of calories. And if you don't eat enough, your hunger is going to increase, right? If you overindulge in food, you're going to what? Gain weight, right? So there's a sweet spot that, that we're called to, you know, the amount of calories that we need to consume. I believe for men, and again, um, if I'm wrong, please forgive me. But I believe for men, it's quoted about 2,500 calories per day. And I think for women, it's between 18 to 2,000 calories per day. Um, you might want to fact check that, but I believe it's somewhere within those numbers, right? And, and of course, this is also going to vary, depend on your body type, how tall you are, how short you are, and stuff like that, right? If you're an athlete, you probably have to consume more calories because you're burning um more calories because you your 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 body's constantly um it, it's constantly being stressed uh, uh, and what i mean by that it means that you're just constantly indulging in physical activity um if you're an athlete and obviously if you are a little bit overweight you might want to consume less calories but again i would strongly recommend speaking of nutrition because i'm not a nutritionist um but this is some of the basic stuff when it comes to that now because when it comes to food, we still have to be disciplined on how we eat. And our flesh is naturally going to crave certain things like sweets. Like I love sweets. I do. I love sweets. I I, I love crisp, crispy cream donuts. Who doesn't, especially when they're hot straight out the oven. My goodness. I'm a big coffee drinker. And for me, I can't just drink it just black. Like I have to have cream and sugar, especially like maybe like vanilla creamers. I love vanilla creamers or hazelnut. Have to have that. And those things consume sugar. And too much sugar is not good for you. Too much sugar is what's going to help you probably increase weight, especially as you get older. You might get that, you know, that 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 that, that gut, <laughs> that, that belly fat, that stubborn belly fat that's hard to lose, which currently I have that right now. That's why I was kind of like rubbing my belly. Um, you know, I love cookies, oatmeal, raisin cookies. Um, I love a good rum cake. I mean, there are things that my body is going to crave and then and naturally so because our body's naturally going to crave certain things. But the older I've gotten, I know that I can't consume as much sugar as I used to when I was a child, because then I'm going to be in a situation where I have the potential or, or increased potential of getting diabetes and diabetes is something that runs 
in my family. So I have to be careful on how much sugar that I consume, that I take. So which means I have to control what my body naturally is going to crave, because if not, it can easily destroy me. I may enjoy it now, but I'm going to suffer the consequences later on. And, that, and, and that's and that's something that is, is going to be always an ongoing battle. But once you're able to get control of it, then and that's it. And then, so now with me, I don't crave sugar like I used to. Every now and then, of course, I'll have something sweet or stu- or something that has sugar in it. But because I've been able to discipline myself and have control over what my flesh is craving, I'm able to have dominion over it. I'm able to control it. I'm not, you know, even if I crave it, I know it's like, you know what? I already had enough sugar today or enough sugar for that week. I'm not going to have any more. And that's always going to be most likely a constant thing that I'm going to have to be conscious of and make sure that I'm constantly in control of. So my point is like our bodies are naturally going to crave certain things. It's just the way it is. So even though you have been um, made new in Christ, you are a new creation, your body, your physical body, there are natural things that God created us to do is going to crave, right? It's going to crave. Even when it comes to, let's say, sex, um, lust, our body are naturally going to crave sex. It's naturally going to create um, crave lust, especially if there's somebody that you're very attracted to, that you're dating, that you're seeing. It, if we're honest, that's just the reality off of it. But the Bible says, obviously, that sex before marriage is what is a sin. And I'm not saying that I'm perfect in this arena because I wasn't. I, you know, it wasn't like I lost my virginity when I got married. That is far, far, far from the truth. But the world makes it think that it's normal. And even for myself, up until that, I, up until I rededicated my life to Christ, I understood the importance of it because to me, it's like, yeah, I heard it, but I didn't think put too much into it because the way I grew up, like sex was normal. And, you know, as long as it's using protection and stuff like that, then it's normal. Right. But there is a reason why God wants that to be sanctified. That he wants that between a man and a woman. He wants that to be in the confines of a husband and a wife within a marriage, because there's a lot that comes along with it. Right. Unwanted pregnancies, STDs, you know, things of that sort. There's soul ties. There's so much. There's an emotional connection that you cannot get rid of because you shared your body with that person. Again, I'm not saying this in a sense where I lived this perfect life in this arena because I did not. What I am saying is that as I've gotten older and much more wiser and and and, and understanding why God has stated and, and, and he commands that sex before marriage, you know, how um, sinful that can be because what it comes along with, but our bodies are naturally going to crave it. Our bodies are naturally going to want it because sex is pleasurable. God made sex pleasurable. He did. It's, it, he didn't just make sex just for it to be boring. No, he made it pleasurable, but there is boundaries and within a certain confine that he wants sex to be because he knows that if it's within a marriage, you're not going to have to worry about unwanted pregnancies. You're not going to have to... And, uh, Again, unless that's something that you and your spouse decide that you don't want to do, but the detriment of it is not at the same level. You're able to enjoy it. You're able to please your partner. You're able to experience all that comes along with it. You don't have to worry about STDs. You don't have to worry about any of those things. Um, it, it, it's like I, me and my wife, we were having a conversation and we were talking about, this was maybe about a couple of months ago. I was like, I don't know. And, and, and I was like, I don't think I don't know. And I never really heard any married couple that's faithful. Keyword faithful, right? Faithful within their marriage, getting an STD. As far as I know of. And she's like, you know what? You're right. But we hear the stories of those who are doing it outside of marriage. These things happen. And this is not a judgment. This is not me trying to judge anybody because, again, I will be lying and saying that this is the way I lived my life all throughout. That is far from the case, but I understand more than ever why God requires us and, 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 and 
really wants us to have sex within our marriage and not outside of marriage. But this is something naturally is always going to be a struggle for those who are single because our body naturally craves lust. It naturally is going to crave sex. Anybody who says differently, they're, they're not being honest. They're not being truthful, but it's having dominion over your life, over your body on when it comes to some of the things that your body is going to crave, your flesh is naturally going to crave. But when you become a new creation and you understand what your identity is, you understand, okay, this, these are the requirements that God is calling me to have. And when I'm able to do that, I'm going to have a much more peaceful life. The Bible says, don't be anxious about anything. And, and that's another topic or, 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 or another example where the world, especially nowadays, and when it comes to mental health, mental health is something that's very serious. You know, I've had a, you know, the first episode of the second season, I had a good friend of mine who is a licensed therapist and she deals with obviously with clients, especially women, because she specialized in women that's dealt with mental health and probably still is. It's, it's, it happens. And it's normal. It's normal within the world. Um, but when you're a new creation, God tells us like, don't be anxious about anything. Present all your requests to him. And the peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And so that's understanding who God is and who he calls us to be and how we're supposed to operate because the world is going to stress you. The world's going to make you anxious. But when you confine in me, you lean on me and you rest in me, I can take all that stress away. So again, understand your identity, understanding that because your identity in Christ, that you are a child of God, your heavenly father is always going to make sure that you have peace. He's always going to make sure that you're able to rest in him. While the world is going to is is going to try to dis constantly disrupt your life and make you stress about what if it's your finances, whether it's about your health, whether it's about your marriage or your relationship, whether if it's school, whatever it is, there's so many things that we can easily stress about and just start getting very anxious about, and 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 now all of a sudden it's like we're we we are anxious and we're angry or we're stressed or we're very fearful, like God says in the Bible that. He does not give us the spirit of fear, but, but power, love, and a sound mind. So that's also, again, understanding what our identity is, that God does not give us the spirit of fear. So when the spirit of fear, or you, you're constantly fearing, very, very fearful, and you're fearing everything, then we know that's coming from a different place. That's not coming from God, because as a child of God, we should not be fearful about everything. We should not be walking through life constantly afraid because when you're walking in life constantly afraid that you're going to start to lack faith and it's impossible to please God without faith because now you're just more concerned about your own self feelings and sometimes creating a false reality or a false narrative in your mind on how your day is going to be like I know somebody um, I know somebody personally where everything to them is fear and it, 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 I don't really understand it. I know actually take that back. I know quite a few people is like that. And it's like, where did this fear come from? Why are you operating like this? And these are people who are believers. They believe in God. They go to church, they pray every day, but for some reason they operate in the sense of, of fear it's like they almost forgot who they are they almost forgot that who that they're a child of god it's almost like they lost their authority because god gives us the authority when you're made a when you're made as a new creation right and you have renewed your mind because the bible tells us to constantly renew our minds and there's a reason why for it because if you're not constantly renewing your mind you got to start thinking very worldly and we have normalized because we live in the world, though we are not, though we are not of this world, but we think worldly and words going to just always bring this influx of fear into our lives. Whether it's about the music that we listen to, whether if it's the movies that we watch 
or watching the news, social media, especially. And yes, there's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of craziness that's going on in this world. There's a lot of, there's just a lot. There, there, there's a lot. You can turn on the news channel, you can go to social media, and you're just going to see just, whether well, it's mass shootings, you're going to see war, bombings, racism. Um, you get, you just, you're seeing genocide. You're seeing it in, man, it, it almost seems like it's almost happening in, in most parts of the world. There's always something negative that's going on, which means it's going to cause some people to operate in fear because it's like, man, if there was a mass shooting in this particular state, what, how, how do I know that's not going to happen over here? How do I know that seeing this child unfortunately died by a straight bullet that it's not going to happen to my son or happen to my daughter? There's such an increase of fear. And because of that, people operate in fear but the bible says that god does not give us the spirit of fear but what power love and what a sound mind a peaceful mind again that's why we we rest in the lord we rest in him and we trust in him that we are covered by him i had a dream i mean about a few weeks ago and i had a dream and i was walking into and I had a series of dreams, but in this particular dream, I, I, I was I was walking into like this, I guess this room or this house. And when I walked in and I can feel demonic activity and I was like, OK, I don't want no parts of this. But then I remember I said, wait a minute. No, I'm a child of God. I have authority. There's power in the name of Jesus. I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. No. You resist Satan, he shall flee. As the Bible says, like, no, I have authority. So I don't operate in fear. So I'm going to operate in the full authority that God has given me. And so in the dream, I said, no, Satan, I have full authority over here, full authority over here. And the moment I said that, that was it. He had no power. He fled. I had another dream, which, which in this dream, I just want to do a quick applause because with this dream that I had, um, this was a warning dream. But in this dream, it was very similar. And, and ironically, I had these dreams maybe like a week apart from each other. But it was a very similar dream where I, I walked into this castle. Um, and you can tell, like, again, it was like different. It was a different setting, but very similar. But the outcome ended up being different. And, and I'll explain why what I, or what what I mean by the outcome being very different. But in this dream, I walk into this house or in this, it looked like this. If you ever watch like any of those like scary movies or whatever, and they have like the, that big house, you know, that's out in the middle of nowhere and it's like dark and stuff like that. I walk in there, you can tell it's very demonic and stuff like that. So I walk in there and if those who have seen the movie Poltergeist, those who have seen maybe the movie ring, you kind of know what I mean as, as I'm going on with the story. And so, or with this dream rather. And so I get in front of this wall and you can sense this demonic activity. There's count, I mean, not calendars, cameras, not cameras. Why well, I'm saying cameras, candles that are around. And I, I'm standing in front of this wall that has a big screen TV and he has a fireplace. And so in the dream, I started, I was like, I started using my authority. I said, say, you don't belong here. I was like, I have full authority over here. I have full authority over it. It's like, you need to release by the, by the blood of Jesus, by the name of Jesus, you need to release these people. Right. And so when I did that and I won't say their names, um, for privacy reasons, but one particular person that I know personally was, it came out the TV screen, which means that, which I already kind of knew because I knew that person was safe. Person comes out, boom, he releases that person. So I just start shouting and shouting even more and just praying, praying. It's like, Say you have no authority by the, you know, you have no authority here. I have all the authority because, because I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. I am using my authority. I'm using my authority. I show no fear. Boldly complain. I mean, not complaining, boldly confessing. But this one particular individual, he was not released. And the crazy part about it, he started repeating what I was praying. Almost like an agreement. But he was like, I have this person's soul. He's mine. And then I woke up. I knew exactly what that dream meant. I knew exactly um, what was going on. So I, anytime that you have any type of dream like that, especially 
First thing you want to do, you want to denounce it. You want to pray, you want to denounce, you want to rebuke anything that's demonic. Number two, especially if it's a, it's, it's a dream that's coming from God, the other thing is you want to, if, if it pertains to a particular individual, you want to tell that person. So that's what I did. So, and, and, and write down your dreams. If God gives you a dream, write down your dreams. That is something I'm still working on. Unfortunately, it's a bad habit where I don't write my dreams down like that. And I'm supposed to. So, you know, I call the person up, explain the dream, tell them what I believe the dream meant. And, I, and the other thing you should do is also ask God the interpretation of that dream. Cause you never want to lean on your own understanding, right? Cause then you, then you, you're going to get it wrong. So, because God is always going to be able to interpret what that dream means. So I did that and I was able to lead this person to Christ because I knew the person wasn't saving. It's something that I was actually praying for for a while, though he believed in God and, and everything. But there's a, there's one thing to believe in God and to pray to God, but it's another thing to be saved. Right. Because being saved is is confessing that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior and that you are a sinner. And so he was able to do that. He got saved. And I was so, so happy. So that, is something that, that is something that I was actually praying for for a good while. But now because of that, he is a new creation, right? So now his identity is going to change. He's, a, he's officially part of God's kingdom. He's officially a child of God. But now he's a baby Christian is what we call it. So he's going to constantly be in in the beginning stages, realistically, without the proper discipleship, he's going to go through a journey where he's going to be confused because, okay, well, I'm a new Christian now. So what's, what's next? Like, what do I do? Right. You know, because all these years I've conformed to how the world want me to be, how the world needed me to operate and how I lived. Now there's changes that have to be made, but you can't just do it on your own. It's not like just a magic wand. It's like, boom, you've been saved and you're all good. No, there's discipleship. There's things that you're going to need mentors. You're going to need, you know, probably find a great church, uh, uh, you know, have a spiritual father, um, you know, maybe have a close relationship with your pastor. If And if you don't have a pastor, find one, you know, or, or somebody that you can trust that you know that is going to give you sound wisdom that God has placed you in your life that once you have been born again, that you're going to be able to navigate in this world as how God has called you to be because it's easy to backpedal. Very, very, very easy to backpedal because remember, we live in a world where there's going to be constant noise. There's going to be constant distraction. There's going to be people who's going to really try to taste like, well, you're a Christian now? Really? This is this how you live in now? It's like, nah, man, come on, man. Let, you know, let's, you'll forget that. And so discipleship is very, very important, especially in the, in the, um, in the beginning stage because Satan is, he's mad. He's dumb mad, right? Like we like to say in New York. He's dumb mad. And so he's not happy. So he's going to try to wheel that person in, especially with the dream that I had with Satan saying that he has his soul. I knew, I knew that the moment that he gets saved, that Satan's going to try, he's going to be upset. So, which led to me and him having a fast and so forth. And that's a whole nother conversation, which was extremely great. It was really, really good. But I don't want to get too, too off topic. But again, it goes back to understanding your identity and understanding your identity and, and seeking your identity in Christ will help you be able to combat and battle against the ways of this world. Because the ways of this world is always going to confuse you. It's always going to put stresses inside in, in, into your body, into your mind. But the way you're able to battle that, again, is knowing that who you are in Christ. Um, let's get into the second scripture that I want to share um, with you guys. And it's Psalms 139, verse 14. And it says, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Many of us heard the scripture before. And I love this scripture because it's, it's that constant reminder that not only that God created us, but he created us to be fearfully, wonderfully made. There's nothing wrong with me. And this doesn't mean that there's changes you may, you may not want to make. Like if you, let's say you want to lose a little bit of weight, let's say you want to go to the gym and gain some muscle, um, whatever your, your goals may be with your physical self, there's nothing wrong with it. 
But understand that you're still fearfully, wonderfully made because we live in a time now, especially because of social media, where we're seeing so many people, especially women, they, where they want to, and even men actually, are not happy with their selves. And they are getting these cosmetic surgeries. And again, I'm not here to judge. I'm not here to knock. But there's this, there's this huge trend of like, hey, I need to get a BBL or I need to get a tummy tuck or I need to do this. And you have some will take it to the extreme where they're getting, they've gotten 10, 12, 15, 20 different plastic surgeries. There was a story that I remember from um, years ago. And there was a woman where she spent, I think it might've been like 70 or 80,000, might even been more than that. It was a significant amount of money because she wanted to look like Kim Kardashian and she spent all this money in cosmetic surgery and to the point where she did not even look the human. She looked like a plastic doll because she wanted to look like somebody else. And so just imagine if she understood, and again, I don't know if she was a believer or not. Maybe she was, maybe she's not. I have, I really have no idea, but just imagine if she remember the scripture or, or, or was presented with the scripture that she is fearfully, wonderfully made understanding that the way God created you, he's, he created you to be beautiful, that you already are beautiful. Again, doesn't mean that, Hey, if you want to, you know, tweak things a little bit, again, you want to go to the gym, you want to work out a little bit, you want to be more in shape. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, but, but when it becomes the extreme and basically you start to idolize other people because you want to be like them, they become your idols or you become self-centered because that could be the other factor as well. It becomes really more about you and less and less about God. This is where you're going to run to that problem because it, it, it becomes your idol. And remember, we serve a jealous God. We serve a jealous God. And, and when something becomes your idol, you start trying to identify yourself or place your identity into that thing. And that's what happens. Um, let's get into um, Galatians chapter two, verse 20. It says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. First Peter chapter one, verse three to five. I love this verse. It says, all praise to God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again, born again, because God raised Jesus from the dead. Now we live with great expectations and we have a priceless inheritance. I want you to remember that word inheritance and that it is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay. And that through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last days for all to see the reason why I love that verse is when he talks about inheritance and when you become part of God's kingdom there is favor there is favor right there is favor and I don't know about you I want all the favor that I can get. I want all the favor I can get. Just like if, let's imagine if you grew up in this very wealthy family, part of this wealthy family, and you know they had all the access and money in the world, and they, 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 you have guaranteed inheritance that's being given to you, which means now you don't have to struggle or lack on anything. No financial struggles. You have all the resources to be able to go into the best schools, the best colleges, um, you could be able to just live the best life. Just that's God. That is God. And I, that doesn't get, I feel like that doesn't get talked about a much about regarding the rewards that we're entitled to. Cause that's what an inheritance is that you're entitled to this. You're entitled to the favor of God, which means you're entitled entitled to the rewards that God has waiting for you. And also why on earth that he wants to give you. The Bible says that he shall supply all our needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. There's a reward. It's not saying that's got, that's going to happen while, when we get to heaven, even here, 
that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So there's a special inheritance that we're entitled to because we are the child of God. We are part of his kingdom. I'm not saying that's what it's all about because ultimately thing is all about serving God. But by serving God, there, there are rewards that comes along with it. So that's why for me, I tell my wife all the time, I focus on the promise, not the problem. When God gives me a promise, I focus on that. I do not focus on the problem. I don't focus on the mountain that is in front of me. I focus on how that mountain is going to get conquered through Christ. Guaranteed. Because God would never send me on a dummy mission. He would never send me to fail. He didn't create me to fail. He created me to win. So I can glorify him in that victory because he gets all the glory. But there's a special inheritance that we are entitled to. And the more we know that, the more we understand that, man, the more we're forced to be reckoned with in God's kingdom, in this earth. See, Satan's going to make it make you think that you're supposed to be in poverty. You're supposed to suffer. You're supposed to struggle. And that's not necessarily the case. When Jesus talks about suffering with him, he's not talking about poverty. He's not talking about sicknesses and diseases because last time I checked in the Bible, Jesus wasn't sick. He, he didn't have any diseases. He was healing people. He was healing the sick. That's what he was doing. So the suffering, suffering that Jesus is referring to is the persecution because the world's going to ridicule, ridicule you. They're going to want you to denounce who Jesus is to the point where they, they're going to try to tempt, it, tempt you with your life. That's what he's referring to. And so there's a special inheritance that we are entitled to as Christ followers. Go to your God. Ask for that special favor. I don't know how many times that I've gone to God and asked God for favor in something he's delivered. Man, God is so good. Even just recently, and it could be something small. Recently, I had to go pick up my daughter. For those who don't know, my daughter lives in Atlanta. Atlanta. And so I went to go visit her. And so I'm, I'm heading down, I, you know, I live in Jersey. So the great thing where I live in Jersey is that I'm 20, about 15, not even 20 minutes, about 15 minutes from Newark airport. I'm about 35 minutes without traveling to LaGuardia, maybe about 50 minutes from JFK, but I'm like an hour and 10 minutes from Philly. So I have four major airports that I could go to, you know, need be, right? And, and for me, I like to look for the best deals. That's just the way I am. That's the way I operate. Some say I'm cheap. Oh, well, listen, I try to get look for the best deals. Philly tends to have some of the cheapest airline tickets, especially flying to Atlanta. So I was going to fly out of Atlanta. And so I, I left a little late because it was a morning flight. So I'm rushing, 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 rushing. I get there. I was going to park my car at the parking garage at Philly airport. And I get there and it's packed. It is so packed. And I'm running, running a little late. Good thing is I have pre-check, but still I'm the type of person I like to get to the airport early, at least an hour and a half. Preferably. That's just me. Cause I don't like to take any chances. And so circling around circle and i mean when it's packed the parking garage is packed you see the signs and everything i said so i was like okay god i need parking favor right now because i can't miss this flight so i asked god for parking favor so i circled around twice and there was other cars circling around and i kid you not within less than a minute because i was like man i wonder if i'm really going to get it and they got that reminder came into my mind it's like no have faith right have faith. i made my request to god and by his will he will grant me that that request so i was like you know what I trust him. I was like, God, I know that you have a parking spot for me. Sure enough, not only he, I got a parking spot, but it was right by the entrance that I needed to go through to get inside the airport. Praise God. I was like, man, God, you are so, so good. And that's what I mean. There's favor. And though that's something small, but it's still favor. Why can't we go to our heavenly father and ask him, for favor on something that we need. He knows what we need. And many times he's waiting to give it to us. We just have to ask for it. We just have to go to him and ask for it. Those who are parents, we know that there's things that we, that we want to give our kids. And if we have the means to be able to do it, what we do, we give it to them. We provide for our kids. We give them the best gifts. We want to make sure that they, they, they have the best things that, especially that we didn't have growing up. I know that's what I do with my daughter. And so just imagine what a heavenly father 
is willing to do for us when he has access to everything because he is the creator. He is the creator. But again, it goes back to understanding our identity. When you understand your identity in Christ, you're not lost. You're not lost. You know who you are. You know what you are entitled to. You know who you are. Recently, I did um, 23andMe. And for those who don't know what 23andMe is, it's just like Ancestry.com where you give a sample of your DNA. And when you give a sample of your DNA, they're able to trace back where your lineage comes from. And so this is something that is extremely, extremely um, popular that has become very popular, especially within the last 10 years or so, right? And I feel like it's it's very important. I strongly encourage people to do it. Ancestry.com and 23andMe are not sponsors at all, but they're more welcome to be a sponsor if they wanted to. Um, but yeah, I, I just strongly recommend it. And when I did it, so I did a 23andMe and, and not knowing that my sister did it. My sister did it as well. And also my sister-in-law actually, because she's the one who actually told me about it. So shout out to her. But my sister did it. And the way I found out is like after I did mine, and mind you, me and my sister were very, very close. It linked my profile with her and it, it automatically identified me and her as brother and sister. I was like, oh shoot, I didn't even know she did it. But the beauty, beautiful part about it was that I was able to see where all my ancestries came from, especially those who are African American or Caribbean American. We know that. You know, we were brought to this side of the world through the Atlantic slave trade. So a lot of us don't know outside of where we grew up. Like my parents are Haitian. You know what I'm saying? They were born and raised in Haiti. I was born here. But outside of that, they don't really know where their ancestors came from because not like they are our ancestors originated in the Caribbean. Just like those who are African American, their ancestries did not originated in United States. Like it traces back most likely to Africa or to Africa. But what part of Africa? Africa is a whole continent. It's not just, it's not a country. It's a continent. It's the biggest continent or one of the biggest continents in the world. So anyways, so I did that, right? Cause I wanted to see, cause again, this helps me identify on who I am, where my people came from, where they descended from. And when I did it, I was able to see, I was like, oh, wow. Um, Nigeria was like the majority of where my ancestors came from. And then there was traces from Ghana, um, Congo. There's also European descent, which makes sense why I'm so light-skinned. Um, there's also um, Latin descent. There's all these different things, but Nigeria and it was Nigeria, Ghana, and I think Benin and Congo were like the top four. But not only that, I was able to see a list of all those who share my DNA, which means that these are all second, third, and fourth, and fifth cousins. Basically, anybody who's done it that has the same DNA as mine, it shows that I'm related to them and how I'm related to them. It is fascinating, 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 fascinating to the point where it's like now I'm doing Ancestry.com so I want to compare. But one of the things that I found out was also very remarkable, it traced it all the way down to... Ramsey, Pharaoh Ramsey the third. And so my ancestry goes all the way back to that. My lineage goes all the way back to that. So which means I'm a descendant of Pharaoh Ramsey the third, which that was mind blowing. It's like, oh wow, there's royalty in my bloodline. And the funny thing about it, I used to always say, like, like my uncles always call me um King Jeff, King Jeff, King Jeff. When I was a little baby, they used to call me Prince, right? Or the young prince, young prince. And even my IG handle is I am King Zamore. Because I believe that I, you know, my ancestors came for royalty, right? Descendants of kings, not knowing that, right? And obviously the king of kings, Lord of the Lords, Jesus Christ, but not knowing that part of it, right? And I was just like, oh, wow, this is fascinating. And so it gave me more of a sense of purpose. And obviously, we know, Ramsey II um, is the one who held Israel captive, um, for, or enslaved Israel for 400 years and Moses had to go there and free them and, 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 and so forth. So I'm not saying like that's the biggest thing to be proud of, <laughs> at least in that regard. But what I am saying is that just understands like where my ancestors came from. And it's like, oh, wow, this is amazing. But it, it helps you understand your identity because you can see 
if you have, let's say, some of these young men who didn't grow up with their father or they don't even know who their father is, there's a sense of being lost, not knowing who you are. Those who may have been adopted, they were an orphan, they were abandoned as a child. There's always going to be this sense of trying to figure out who you are, right? Where did I come from? Who are my parents? Because you're lost now. And so you're searching for what your true identity is. Though somebody can tell you, but there's something about knowing where you come from that gives you this fulfillment and this purpose in life. And so your identity in Christ, knowing that is going to give you a sense and purpose and God and know what God's will is for your life. So you're not navigating through life lost, confused, or identifying with something that may seem good right now, but in the long run will destroy you. So it's understanding what your identity is. There's so much more I can talk about this video and um, regarding this topic rather, but I probably, I most likely I may do a part two and you know just add some people into this conversation because I really feel like this is such a great, rich conversation to have that you can't just fit all this in within an hour or 30 minutes because um, this video is a little bit longer than I expected to be or this episode. But I thank you guys for watching and listening. And, and, I, and I hope and I pray that you're able to gain something from it and, and understand more what your identity is and understand that and know that once you know and you allow the Holy Spirit to remind you what your identity is, you have authority over your life. And I really, truly, truly mean that. The Bible says that you have authority over your life because you're a child of God. You're covered by the blood of Jesus. And so when you're navigating through this world, that though, yes, there's going to be some ups and downs. There's going to be some challenges because that's what comes with the territory. But just understand that there is victory on the other side. Just know that you're not navigating through this life loss, that you're going to navigate through this life knowing that every step that you take, there is victory that you can conquer that giant that stands in front of you, that you will see that giant just how um, Joshua and um, um, Caleb saw that giant. And that's how you want to view life, that that giant is meant for you to conquer it because you are covered by God. You are covered by, by the blood of Jesus, because God is never going to send you somewhere. And he definitely did not create you in this world to fail. You just got to come to his kingdom, stand under his perfect, stand under his perfect will. And I promise you, I promise you, as long as you do that, victory is always going to be yours. I don't know why I put my hands up like that. Not really sure. Anyways, doesn't really matter. But until the next episode, one love.